Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. It's time to have a look at the suggestions passed to developers for the aviation side of things. There are a few here that we've already gone through in the past, so we're going to skip them since there's no point in going over them twice. As always, if you enjoy the content, make sure to subscribe to the channel and also like the video. The first vehicle is the Ferry Gannett AS Mark IV. This was an anti-submarine naval aircraft and also reconnaissance plane, which actually also served with the German Bundesmarine in 1957. It was used to complement the Seahawk Mark 100 and Mark 101 strike, patrol, and anti-submarine capabilities. 16 machines were adopted from Britain, a big factor of the purchase being the immediate availability of the plane, uh, 15 of the Gannets were combat variants, the AS Mark IV, while the last one was a trainer version that was converted from the AS Mark IV to the Gannet T5. The planes were operated from the Fliegerhorst Schlegwig Bay Jagel base by the Marine Fliegerschwader II and later the Marine Fliegersch Fliegerschwader III and were mainly employed as coastal reconnaissance and patrol aircraft, but also as potential anti-submarine strike fighters, in case of Soviet attack. All 16 Gannets were retired in 1966, when they were replaced by the French Brigade uh, 1150. The Gannet was generally seen as very reliable, and also a well-liked plane, which performed admirably in most weather conditions, while conducting various tasks such as coastal surveillance, long-range patrols, and search-and-destroy missions. The dual-engine contra-rotating propeller setup allowed the pilot to switch one engine off during flight, which greatly reduced speed at the advantage of more range. In case of an engine failure, the plane would still be airworthy and able to return the crew to safety without risk of crashing. The Gannet was not a direct air-to-air -air combat plane, because of its vastly inferior speed compared to other contemporary military planes, such as the Seahawk, the F-84, and other early jet planes, and therefore did not need to be armed with guns, since the primary enemy it would face were submarines, although ships could also be attacked, and its arsenal of bombs, rockets, depth charges, and torpedoes, thanks to its carrying of up to 2,000 pounds, and the presence of a large bomb bay, which was able to carry most of the Gannet's weaponry, save for the rockets, which had to be mounted under the wings. The next one is once again for the Soviets, and it's one of these very, very big interceptor vehicles that were built, the Lavochkin LA-250A, the Anaconda. This uh, was a supersonic jet interceptor intended to serve for the Soviet Air Force to counter the threat of American strategic bombers in the Cold War, such as the B-52 Stratofortress. There were 20 or more flight tests on the LA-250, but the production was cancelled. A total of five were actually built, though, so at least it was around. The vehicle used two Lyulka AL-7F afterburning uh, turbojets. Uh, the vehicle could uh, basically be able to produce 9,000 kgf each from the engines themselves. Uh, the rate of climb was 70.4 meters per second and also um, had a pretty decent speed attached to that as well when it felt like it. Uh, the armament, though, is where it kind of falls apart. Uh, the armament itself uh, was only two RS-2U beam-riding air-to-air missiles or two 275A semi-active radar homing air-to-air -air missiles. This was before the time where the Soviets kind of uh, got themselves the Sidewinder, you know, where um, the infamous story, which we'll talk about in the future, where the Sidewinder got stuck in a plane, and that's how they actually got the technology for it. So let's just say these missiles aren't exactly the best. Um, and having only two of them, obviously, is a little bit rough. It also didn't have any guns uh, on the vehicle either. The vehicle could go 1,800 kilometers an hour without the missiles, and with them 1,600 kilometers an hour, meaning that it was pretty nippy, but yeah, very limited in armament. The next vehicle is the Kawanishi N1K1, which is an experimental seaplane. In September of 1940, the Navy order to design the number 15 experimental seaplane fighter was given to Kawanashi. This was the first plane in a category of seaplane fighters. 
This category was for the battle on the Pacific Islands uh, that uh, would take as priority before construction of the front lines on the islands. Design of the N1K1 started in September of 1940 and first flight of the prototype was on the 6th of May 1942. It had the best engine at the time, the Casse. Uh, this engine uh, would have large torque, so the first prototype was given contra-rotating propellers to deal with it. Also, this is the first plane to equip the automatic combat flap uh, for the Japanese. At first, uh, its side floats were planned to be retractable, but that was cancelled, and the contra-rotating propellers of the N1K1 were the same as the recon seaplane, the E-15K1, the Xiyun, but the mechanism wasn't adopted for the second prototype or later. Uh, the vehicle also uh, had access to some other things, uh, such as a pretty beefy armament of two 20mm machine guns, two 77 machine guns, and also uh, two 30kg bombs on top of it, uh, so it would be quite nice. The next one is the Chengdu J-10A, and I'm just going to read this first paragraph of Baton. Um, I think what I'm going to do in the future is just skip this person's posts. Uh, I don't know who's passing them. They make absolutely no sense, and they have a bunch of grammatical and spelling mistakes. It's hard to work out what's even being said. So here we go. The Chengdu J-10 is a Chinese multi-role fighter of the fourth generation, developed at first to be a third generation. His original goes go back at 1981 when China ordered the development of a new plane following a new way to get the plane. Instant of giving the requirement of the plane, they wanted to b one builder and get what the builder make. They made a competition between three major builder and choose the more interesting of them. It was Chengdu who got the contract to develop the new plane from their proposition. The J-9 was their initial proposition, who was never built. It was a plane that was likely inspired by the J-37 Gripen. The plane, however, was too advanced for the Chinese capacity, incorporating 60% of new technology. The J-10 was the most modern plane that China could build. This slowed the development and all the technology needed to be tested the compartment being adapted to each other and at the end of what the industry wasn't capable to produce it since it was too advanced for their capacity. The plane was finally built in 1997 and flow in 1998. It was already 17 years that the plane had been developed back then and it was just entering the trial. But the trial appear to had went well as the plane was put into production in 2002. The first planes were, was in service 17 years that the plane had been developed back then, and it was just entering the trial. Uh, but the trial appeared to had went well as the plane was put into production in 2002. The first planes was in service in 2006 and only revealed in 2007. The result was quite impressive. The plane was remarkably modern and looked oddly like the IEI La Vie, which led to believe that Israel had been involved in the development of the J-10 deliberately or unconsciously. Various credible source and photo evidence go in favor to the theory of Israel selling the blueprint of the Larvi to China is considered as fact by the U.S. Air Forces, Russian Intelligence, IHS Jane's and Luyika's uh, engineer who worked on the J-10 to adapt the Russian engine. It was been described by the Luyukas engineers as a melting pot of foreign technology from the F-16, Israel, Russia, and China. But the fact is China had built this plane, integrating a lot of technology that was from other country and adapted with each other. Nonetheless, this plane would be a great addition for the game. The J-10A being the first standard version of the J-10 will offer the basic yet great performance. As for 2021, a total of 200 J-10As is believed to be in service in China. The MD-410 is also on the list for France. This started as a result of the outbreak of war in Algeria. The French government issued a requirement for a twin-engined aircraft capable of performing ground attack missions. The requirements for the aircraft were as follows, to weigh under 5 tonnes, range of 1,080 nm, cruising speed of 260 knots, and weapons including two 30mm cannons, bombs, rockets, or air-to-ground missiles. Dassault responded to this request with the MD-410 Spiral. 
The twin turboprop aircraft had a weight of 5.5 tons, was capable of speeds of uh, 500 kph, and could carry a host of weaponry on its four underwing hardpoints, as well as twin 30mm DEFA cannons mounted at the bottom of the fuselage. Other competitors for this request also arose in the shape of the previously suggested Sudwest uh, Voltigeur, the Sipper S1100, the Potes 75, and Moraine Saulnier 1500. A few others were also suggested, but didn't make it past the design table. The same airframe also resulted in the MD-415 Communauté, uh, the primarily a liaison aircraft, but with a secondary role of ground attack. What this meant is that the aircraft had the same hardpoints as the Spiral, but lacked the fuselage-mounted guns that the Spiral did have. On the 26th of May, 1959, seeing that their respective corporations were working on the same type of program, the Voltigeur and also the Communaut, uh, uh, and for reasons of increased efficiency and cost-effectiveness, Marcel Dassault and Sud Aviation CEO George Herrera decided to join forces to build a twin-engine aircraft for two different missions. Liaison, training, and ground attack, the aircraft was flown by GAMD under the name Comon, uh, Comonte. Ground attack and multi-purpose missions along the lines of the Sud Aviation Voltigeur, also produced as a model by GAMD under the name Spiral. Eventually, in 1960, the French government decided to buy aircraft from the surplus uh, the United States Air Force had to perform these ground attack missions, thereby also rejecting all the French domestic proposals. Given the advanced sta stage of work, many of the manufacturers still involved decided to still press on development of their aircraft and achieve first flight. For the Spiral, this feat was achieved at Bordeaux Merignac uh, on the 8th of April 1960, and Paul Boudier and Gilles Breck at the controls. The Air Force, nonetheless, uh, showed interest, albeit in a slightly modified version, later named the Spiral III. This would basically be the same design, but 1.3 times larger. However, this program with two was shortly thereafter put on hold because of the lack of funding. No further development was undertaken on the aircraft, despite interest from several other nations. The Spiral III remained a paper project. Now, as far as armament goes for the aircraft, the aircraft was by default armed with two 30mm DEFA cannons mounted under the fuselage. In the main uh, image, you can see the bulges extruding from the bottom. These are the gun housings. On top of that, the aircraft featured six wing hardpoints that could carry two 1000s, uh, four 500s, or 24 100-pound bombs, rockets up to six 37mm SNEB pods, uh, and also 68mm SNEBs in up to six pods containing seven rockets each, and finally four SS-11s or four SS-12s. The last one is for Israel, and it's the F6K-15NT Mustang. This was an armed reconnaissance variant of the P-51K Mustang, uh, which, of course, was around for Israel. The background and acquisition is one of the more interesting areas, so I think we'll focus on there. Due to the lackluster information on this specific airframe, I chose to also go over some background on this specific airframe. This is from the poster. The F-6K that served with the Israeli Air Force was the production serial 44-12843, making it a part of the batch of the 43 F-6Ks, which were produced in February to March of 1945, designated the F-6K-15NT. The F-6K was essentially an armed reconnaissance variant of the P-51K, distinguished by its onboard camera uh, equipment and the portholes it had on the side and bottom of the fuselage for the cameras to see from. These aircraft were originally intended to be delivered to the 8th Air Force of the USAF to fight in both the European and Pacific fronts of the Second World War. However, very few examples of this variant were actually sent, and 44-12843 was not one of them. This specific F-6K's fate in its initial years is largely unknown, and it is simply assumed that it remained in a storage crate right up until the moment it was acquired by the Israelis, since that was the fate of many of the F-6K's that were never sent to war, at least until they were bought for civilian use or were scrapped. 
Many sources wrongly believe that this Mustang was one of the S26 reconnaissance Mustangs that were purchased from Sweden. However, that was not the case for this specific airframe, and most likely the reason that it ended up with Israel was that it was probably purchased by Al Swimmer, uh, one of Israel's primary agents in America at the time, while it was still in a storage crate and was later smuggled out of the country at some point. Regardless of the exact way that this Mustang ended up in Israel, it arrived in the port of Haifa on the 28th of June 1954 and was immediately pressed into service with the Israeli Air Force. Seeing as this specific airframe was delivered only in mid-54, it led a pretty short service life. In the Israeli Air Force, it received the identification number 2339, which was shortened to just 39, and was put into service with the 116th Squadron. Uh, back in those years, it was known as the Flying Wing Squadron. During its service, it appeared to have never actually been utilized as a reconnaissance aircraft. Instead, it was utilized in exactly the same way the rest of the IF, uh, IF's Mustangs. The F-6K was used in combat during the Sinai campaign of the Suez Crisis in October of 1956, and then was retired from service shortly afterwards, along with the rest of the IF's Mustangs. So the vehicle itself, obviously having a short service life, but an interesting story. It might be worth trying to find more about it. As always, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Millie Draper, Juan the Panda, Nick R. Kupila, Carrion Crow, Gus Irenicus, Pyman, Merciless Reaper, Orange Tail, Teddy, Daniel Stanton, Moxie B. Young, Peter Grayling, Jerry Provolt, Bereen, Alan Hacker, Sem Arslan, Uncle Bean, Derek R., and Lafouche for supporting the channel.